Marcus Aurelius said, what we do in life echoes through eternity. What is your life echoing through eternity? Welcome to Echoes Through Eternity with Dr. Jeffrey Skinner. Our mission is to inspire, engage, and encourage leaders from across the globe to plant missional churches and be servant leaders. So join us and hear the stories of servant leaders reverberating lives as God echoes them through eternity. Brought to you by Missional Church Planting and Leadership Development and Dynamic Church Planting International. Welcome into Echoes Through Eternity. I am your host, Dr. Jeffrey D. Skinner. What is God echoing through your life today? Well, I want to continue our conversation from last week. We were talking about center set theology. And so I wanted to talk about what is an alternative to center set theology, or bounded set and fuzzy set. Today, I want to talk about bounded set theology, also known as exclusivist or boundary focused theology. It's a perspective that embraces clear boundaries and distinct definitions of who's considered in and who's considered out of a particular group or community. This mindset often revolves around a rigid set of doctrinal beliefs or behavioral expectations that determines one's acceptance within the community. Now, let me stop here. So are, are you're saying, is this, Jeff, are you saying that you can't have a denominational affiliation to this? And the answer is no, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is we do not set adherence to and 100% agreement to a specific denominational mindset or even ideology before we allow someone to enter into a relationship with us. And especially, we don't set that as a boundary or a prerequisite for relationship with Jesus. A lot of times we like to kind of place clear boundaries on someone, you know, whether or not they're a Christian or not. If you think about it, it's kind of based in self-preservation. We want to know if this person is Christian, they identify more with us, and so we may consider them to be safe. The problem is that Christian in and of itself has become so broad it's almost become a national identity, which is what we talk about when we talk about Christian nationalism, is that, you know, to be born in America is to be born Christian. And that's that's not what the Bible advocates. That's empire theology. That's empire religion, not Yahwehism, not Christianity, not Christ-centered religion there. And so when we start talking about you've got to adhere to this particular ideology before you can be friends with us, before you can enter into Jesus, be a relationship with Jesus, then you know that's bounded set theology. And a lot of our churches do that. And that's a lot of times based in self-preservation. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes there. While bounded set theology may offer a sense of identity and security to someone, it can also have detrimental effects on fostering genuine Christian community. In other words, adherence to a set of beliefs becomes the measure for a relationship with Jesus as opposed to true transformation. Look, I know a lot of ethical atheists. How can one be ethical and be atheist? Well, there we have... You know, don't let's just use the, these you know little pithy saying here. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't go with people who do. So you could be atheist and still adhere to those principles there, right? That doesn't make you Christian. You can you can say the Hail Mary. You can say the you know three Hail Marys every day when you wake up. It doesn't necessarily make you Christian. It is centering a relationship on Jesus and moving in the direction of Jesus. That's what makes one Christian. A disciple, so everybody thinks they know what disciple means, but a true disciple is one who's a servant of Jesus, period. It's not one who reigns, it's one who serves. That is a true and is in complete obedience and seeking complete obedience to Jesus. It's not a set of ideology, ideological principles. A lot of times we'll use the Apostles' Creed as a measure of what is Christian thought. Well, that may be Christian thought, but it's not just thinking that makes one Christian. Thinking alone does not transform one's life. It's submitting one's life to Jesus. It's what changes one's life. 
repentance, which we can't, we kind of turned into this, you know, decision. Make I'm going to make this decision to repent. Yes, you make a decision, but that decision is not a one-time decision. It's making an everyday decision that every thought I have, I take captive. Every thought I have, I'm going to submit to Jesus. I'm going to live in a way that Jesus taught me to live. I'm going to to advocate for the poor. I'm going to advocate for the for the least of these. And I'm going to seek to serve as opposed to reign. And that's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. It's not just a thought that's out there. Whereas a bounded set tends to be more mental adherence to a particular way of thinking. And and again, this doesn't just happen within Christian circles. It can be progressives that think some of the liberal and progressive ideology that's out there today will just pull one out of the ether here, climate change. If you don't today, these days, is if you don't believe that gas stoves, that gas stoves are evil, you can't be progressive. We'll take another one, abortion. If you don't believe that killing children or that abortion is illegal, I mean, mean, back up. If you don't believe that abortion should be legal, that a woman should be able to choose, that's you can't be a part of the progressive community there. Now, again, I say that because I'm just letting you understand that bounded set theology, bounded set thought, is it goes both ways. It's not just a conservative thought. It's a liberal thought. It's a progressive thought. It's any community that demands strict adherence to a set of beliefs before you're welcomed into that community. And that is the opposite of what the way Jesus chose to live his life. It's the opposite of what Jesus modeled for us. And it's the opposite of what God's call is on our life. Otherwise, as Gentiles, who we were thought as less than the least of these during Judaism, when Jesus came to earth there, we were we were dogs. We were not the chosen people, but he grafted us in. He chose for us to be here. And then we turned it into this exclusionary faith. If other ideologies want to do that, maybe that's fine for them, but it, it becomes really important for us because that is not what God has called us to be. He has not called us to be, first and foremost, ideological people. He's called us to be transformed people and to be grace, to be His hands and feet in the world, to offer the same grace and mercy to others that He offered to us, even though we recognize we are broken. And so bounded set theology may offer a a sense of identity and security to some, but its detrimental effects our, our fostering Christian community are, are horrible. One of the primary challenges that arrives from it is, is a potential for exclusion and judgment. And when we start setting strict boundaries, we lose people to the faith. We, I heard an interview with a guy that was a year ago who was an atheist, and he was on a program, and they were talking politics at the time. Now, this guy happened to be conservative, but he was atheist. And so, but he, he, prior to being an atheist, I mean, he was always an atheist, but prior to being conservative, he talked about how he was more liberal in his ideology and that he felt like the progressive ideology had kind of abandoned him. Again, yeah, he was liberal. He had an identity there, which is why we don't place our identity in politics. So he had an identity. And so when he did that, then what they considered in changed. They changed rules and he got left out. And so he was kind of in no man's land as this atheistic conservative because at least what he perceived no man's land because he felt like that to be Christian, you had to be Republican. To be Christian, you had to be conservative. And that's not true. I know a lot of good people that call themselves progressive. Thomas Ord is one of those people. I had him on a couple of weeks ago. Thomas Ord and I disagree on a lot of issues. We dis- we agree on a lot of issues as well. He's a Nazarene. He's a fellow Nazarene. I consider him a brother in Christ. We agree on the faith of Jesus. We agree that Jesus was Lord. We agree on a lot of things. There's some things we disagree on, but he is a good guy. He's a progressive, but he's a good guy. He's pro-choice. I disagree with that, but he's a good guy. 
So I'm not going to go all through all the things that we disagree with, but my point is that I love I love Thomas Ord, and there's a lot of other progressives that I love, a lot of pastors out there that I love that I disagree with. Bounded set theology does not allow that. And so this atheist, I just heard another interview with him yesterday. He's now come to Christ. He's not necessarily conservative. He still considers himself liberal. He just does not consider himself progressive. He's primarily conservative on the financial side, but he's going to lean more and probably be more in agreement with the traditional liberal side, politically speaking here again. Had they created a boundary for him, for the Christian faith that said, no, you've got to adhere 100% to everything that we think and believe before you can have a relationship with Jesus, he would have never been baptized into the faith. The exclusivist mindset hinders the formation of authentic relationships and hinders the unity that Christ calls us to pursue. Instead of embracing diversity, and I don't mean just diversity in color, or I mean diversity of thought. We learn from other people's perspectives. I have a doctorate I still learn. I've read four books in the last two weeks because I'm still learning. I read Alan Hirsch's Metanoia. I read Alan Hirsch's Reformation. I've read Alan Hirsch and Rob and the other, I forget the other author, but The Spirit and the Starfish, all of them talk about how to live this. While they may not name Center Set Theology, they're talking about how to live and how to embody being the church. Because what we've done here in Western culture is, is kind of unintentionally use language like worship center or enter to, ser- enter to worship, leave to serve, exit to serve. And language matters inside of, of a church because inside of our Christian theology because language shapes culture. And we want a culture of transformation. We've got a very vague definition of discipleship, but again, discipleship is about serving Jesus. It's about submitting to Jesus. And so when we center on Jesus, then the closer we get to Jesus, the more we're submitted to Him, the more we submit to Him because we recognize that our life is beginning to flourish more. The closer we are to Jesus, the more we we live our life in a cross-shaped fashion where we serve others as opposed to rule over others, which is an empire mentality there. The more we serve others, the more we thrive. The kingdom is kind of upside down. The kingdom of God is upside down from this empire mentality that we have where it says we have to rule with power. We have to wield power. But Jesus gave away power. He could have literally, if he wanted to, he was God incarnate. And we, you know, the within limits, and we won't go back to the or discussion here, but, but you know, God, Jesus can't out, act outside of God's nature. But within, so within those limits there, Jesus broke the mold of, of what a, a Messiah was. That, but he could have called upon, he could have forced the Roman Empire to bow at his feet, his feet if he wanted to, but he chose not to because he wanted the opportunity for the even the Roman Empire who had enslaved his people, who had enslaved God's people. He wanted even them to come to a relationship with him. He even wanted them to to thrive. He wanted the Pharisees and Sadducees to thrive. He wanted the Samaritan people to thrive. Jesus wanted every, he, not one to perish, right? And so bounded set is the opposite of that. It, it excludes people. Furthermore, bounded set theology may lead to a sense of superiority or of elitism. When a community believes that we possess that all the truth and others are considered outside of it, there's a risk of adopting an arrogant attitudes towards those who hold different beliefs or perceptions. This can hinder genuine dialogue. It hinders relationship. And how are people going to know Jesus if we don't have a relationship with them? If we put conditions upon a relationship with others, How are we ever going to have a relationship? How are we ever going to be be able to invite them to have a relationship with Jesus there? And that's what centered set theology is. Bounded set is the opposite of that. Another harmful effect is the potential for isolation and insularity. 
It focuses on a pro- primarily on who's in and who's out. And there's a tendency to prioritize self-preservation over reaching out and engaging with the broader community. The inward focus can prevent the church from fulfilling its mission of spreading the love and message of Jesus Christ to the world there. And so again, you know, self-preservation there, that's based in fear. And Jesus has called us out of fear. You've heard it said, you know, I'm sure you've heard the little little saying, you know, Fear, fear is 360, appears 365 times in the Bible, and that's one for every day. Do not fear. I tell you, sometimes I don't need 365 do not fears. I need one for every second of every day. There are days that that I can look at the world, and if I listen to the enough news, if I listen to enough commentary, I become afraid. And I have to turn back to that Bible and remind myself that Jesus has not given us a spirit of fear. He's not given us a spirit of timidity. Timidity. Jesus has called us to be victorious, not through our own strength, not through reigning, but victory in Christ looks like serving the world. And in serving the world, people see something different in us. And that is where people come to a relationship with Jesus. That's where people begin to repent. And I say begin to repent because it's not a one-time decision. Just as we have to remember to take our thoughts captive all the time, we have to remember to not fear all the time. We have to remember that we have to constantly be repenting. And what is repenting is just turn around. So we continue walking in the direction of Jesus there. So centered set theology allows for greater openness and flexibility, encouraging individuals to grow and change while remaining centered on Jesus. This approach promotes a spirit of humility, empathy, and genuine relationship building, fostering an inclusive and diverse community that reflects the heart of Jesus. And when again, when I say diversity, I'm talking thought, I'm not necessarily talking about his color. I'm talking, you know, diversity means just different. You know, I, I grow, my wife, we disagree on a lot of different things. We were raised in different homes. We've been married for 31 years in August. August 1st, we will, we will celebrate 31 years of marriage. And we didn't, I didn't insist that she believe and agree with everything that I say. That what happens when we have a disagreement on, on the way we're parenting, we sit down and we talk. When we have a disagreement on the way that we spend our money, we sit down and we talk. And ultimately we come out with a, with a agreement and an activity out of that, that is better for both of us. I am a better person 31 years later, far better than I was the day we married. Lisa, my wife, is a far better person today than she was when we married because we've learned to grow together. And that's the same thing with the Christian community, is when we we thrive, when we learn and compromise and begin to adapt, and serve each other. Transformation takes place. And then when people outside the church see us, instead of us being on TV protesting, they hear the love of Jesus come out of our minds, our mouths and and in our minds and hearts. They are attracted to that and they say, I want what they have. It kind, of, kind of reminds me of the, the movie when Harry met Sally. Remember when she's in the diner there and she goes off when she's singing in the restaurant there and and the older lady looks over at her and, and she says, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> That's the same way with our relationship with Jesus is when people hear and see our experience and, and witness our experience in relationship with Jesus. And somebody comes to them and they say, what can I do for you today? They look at us and they say, I'll have what he's having. I'll have what she's having. I'll have what they're having. And then they become a follower of Christ. Let us strive to build bridges rather than walls. And let love and acceptance define our communities. I'm not suggesting that you can't stand up for what you believe in. But you stand up for it in a different way than what an empire does. We've seen that force doesn't work. 
you know, I can, I can force you. Let's say communists take over the country tomorrow. We don't, we don't even have to imagine it. Let's look to China. China is the fastest growing nation of Christians on the planet. In other words, there are more people in China that are becoming Christian every day than any other nation on this planet. China is actively trying to squash Christianity. So that proves that forcing someone to believe doesn't work. You can create a Christian nation. You can create a nation that adheres to Christianity, founded on Christian principles, but you cannot legalize, you cannot force them to legally accept Jesus because that's not transformation. That's behavior modification. So let's live in ways that are attractional. Let's live in ways that are centered on Jesus. Let's live in ways and in communities that foster transformation. And again, if you want to see some examples of this, if you want to hear kind of, I I encourage you, read the book, The Spirit and the Starfish. I just finished that book. We'll have an episode, maybe two episodes on that here in the near future. Next week, we're going to talk about fuzzy set theology or fuzzy set thought. What is that and what that means and how that looks. I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast today. I encourage you to like and subscribe Share this with your friends. And again, this costs money, but it's not monetized. You know, we've got a new sponsor of the show, but it's friends of mine. It's Regal and Jenna Drake Garcia, both fantastic people. They've got a company made for more. What they love to do is partner with people who have a call in their lives. People like me, people like you, people who are called to make a difference, but they, they feel trapped. They have this call on the one hand, on the other from Jesus to, to make a difference in the world. But simultaneously, they're, they're bound to a job. They're bound to, and oftentimes, a job they don't like. And so they have this existence that they eke out, but they have this ministry they love. Jenna and Regal help marry that action. They help you monetize your ministry. Not in ways that are unaffordable, not in ways that are elite, but in ways that that empower. They're really educational. That's what they are. They they empower leaders, Christian leaders, to embody their call and learn to make money off of that. And you think, well, that's bad. You're going to make money off of ministry. Actually, it's not. Paul was a tent maker. He made. That's how he supported himself. There's, there's nothing wrong with, with monetizing your ministry. One of the discussions we have and we're having at DCPI is we offer all of our training for free. They have to raise their money. Everybody that's a part of, of DCPI is self-funded. They raise their support in order to be part of that organization there. No one gets a salary unless that salary is raised by outside support. So we give away the training, and that's what enables us to do that. Unfortunately, at least in a North American context, sometimes people perceive because there's no value that perceives that there's no value in that training because people don't, because we do not charge money for that training. It costs lots of money to do this training. We have to pay for airfare when we go and do these on site trainings. We have to pay for whether it's, you know, here in America or in in Africa somewhere or Indonesia, we have to pay these leaders food when they go there. We have to pay for their transportation. We have to, in, in country, have to pay for their housing. All that costs money, but it's done by raising that support. The people who take our training don't, don't see all that. We don't share those details. So sometimes it's perceived as not having value because we don't charge money. When it doesn't have value, people do not, participate often in that training sometimes and so that's where ministry that's where regal and jenna help you as they partner with you and help you to to recognize the value and then come to an agreement a conclusion of what of how you can do that so made for more.io jenna and regal i encourage you to reach out to them they're just they're two fantastic people got a fantastic family We'll be back next week. We'll talk about Fuzzy Set Theology again. Like and subscribe. I'm eternally grateful for your listening here. And you have a fantastic day.
I hope this was helpful and educational. You can be a co-creator with God by helping to echo our voices, share our episode with friends and family and on your own social media accounts, give us positive five-star reviews. Uh, the more positive reviews we have, the more visibility we have, and the more voices that are echoed through eternity. Uh, we often invite guests who are serving faithfully year after year, often in anonymity in their respective roles in ministries. God sees them, and, and the reality is, is for a good kingdom leader, that's enough. Uh, we do not do what we do for the accolades of humanity. We do it because we're called by God. But I believe that God uses people like you and I to continue those reverberations and echo them throughout eternity. You can partner with God by liking, subscribing, writing a quick positive five-star review, and again, sharing those voices with friends and family and on your own social media accounts. Those reviews will eventually lead to other guests who have larger platforms that have more listeners who will then in turn listen to the show. And again, it further echoes those voices, which is the whole vision of the Echoes Through Eternity podcast here is to continue echoing those voices that God is echoing um, through eternity there. <laughs>